to the stage, Mr. John Carlo Esposito! What a warm welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you and we are so happy we get to spend some time with you here on the stage. You look fantastic, by the way. Thank you. Gosh, so put together, so very dapper. Thank you. You and I have worked together before, and you know I like to get right out to everybody's questions because we're here for them. And I just wanted to say thank you for all the time that you spend with our, our customers who are here in line to see you. So it's a, a kindness, and we appreciate all the time that you give them when you're down on the floor working so hard. So thank you. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. You bet. Oh, you guys. Thank you. For you. Round of applause for you guys being so awesome. We'll start over here. What's your name and what's your question? Um, I'm Diego from, like, Beaverton. Um, <laughs> My question is, uh, since Better Call Saul has ended, um, I, if Vince Gilligan were to offer you the role of Gus a third time, would you take it? Yes, in a heartbeat. Yeah. No hesitation. Yeah, you know, look, I, I feel like uh, Vince Gilligan is a, is a master in what he does, a master craftsman. I'm sure after so many years of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, he might want to take a little break to brainstorm and do something else, but. I, I propose that we eventually get to a show, whether it's limited or a little bit extended for a few years, called The Rise of Gus. I hope you can all appreciate during this panel how lovely and pleasant he is in comparison to the characters he plays. If I see, I see you nodding, right? I mean, it's, it is a gift to find villainy that makes me believe you might be that way in real life, and then it's like a shock, you roll in like a ray of sunshine. We have a question over here. What's your name, where are you from? Hello, uh, my name is Robert Baldwin, and I'm from Beaverton. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, recently uh, we heard that uh, you went to Marvel and uh, asked for a role, and, uh, and, uh, Knowing that uh, if you do get the role, um, uh, which character would you want to play? I love how all this happens, um, and, and everything gets sort of a little... Um, so uh, the fans come to me when I'm in line a lot at Comic-Cons, and it started with Doctor Doom um, maybe over a year ago, and then fans came and said, um, maybe it's Magneto you should do. Oh, no, excuse me, then it was Freeze, then it was Magneto. And these are fans suggesting to me what might be appropriate for me to do. Uh, and then, yeah, right? And then so the last year, like 10 or 15 people are coming and saying, it's X, and they asked me, would you like to do that? I said, I'd love to be in the Marvel Universe. The this, this, this truth of the story is this. Uh, about four years ago, I met with Luis D. Esposito, who I missed yesterday at D23 for Marvel. He's in the television unit of Marvel. And they had come to me um, to play, possibly play Loki on the television side. And, and so I did not do that. Uh, uh, and there were, there were reasons for it. I think I wasn't the one who was chosen to be the honest truth. Uh, but I, I would have maybe liked to do it. And then I thought when I wasn't, selected for that, that it would be great if I could be in a Marvel movie, not just a television show. Because I like films a lot, I love television, obviously I've had a great run in the television world doing, and last year was four shows at one time, and the year before, five shows at one time. So, all that got translated when the fan casting started to blow up that they'd like to see me uh, play Professor X, um, it got so huge, I finally had to have my people call Marvel and explain that, you know, look, that this is a fan want and we'd love to work with you. Um, and they aren't quite ready to get into that conversation. But when they are, I am here. <laughs> Great question. Hi, question over here. Hello, my name is Marcel, I'm from Portland, Oregon, and my question is, do you have any pet peeves? <laughs> yes, I do have a number of pet peeves. Uh, it would take a long time for me to get through all of them. Um, I, I'm looking at these three doorways, and, I, I, and we as human beings, we get to a doorway, an arch, or something that leads from one place to another, and what do we do? We stand there. Like, I mean, come on, like, look at the doors. They're not to be stood in. We are to be walked through and keep going. But no, we get there and we just stand there. 
One of my pet peeves, among many. Thank you, Marcel, for the question. The question over here. Hi, what's your name? Uh, hi, I'm Kenny from Kenny. Portland. And my question is, how did you first get into acting? Uh, I was watching a television show with my brother, and it was called Gigantor, that tells, um, tells I'm telling on myself, uh, to tell you how old I am. And, <laughs> you know, it was sort of a version of, um, God, what is that show we have now, that movie we have with all those big animated cars that turn into people and monsters? Transformers? Transformers! It was an early Transformers on television. Yeah, late 50s, maybe even late 40s. No, not that old. Just kidding. <laughs> but, but uh, and, and, and my mother and father were going through a divorce and my brother and I were watching television. We thought, we, there's gotta be something we can do to help. And I knew I had talent. And so we went to my mom and said, hey, can you take us to an agent? We'd love to be able to do some commercials or a television show, because we saw a commercial during Gigantor and we thought, oh, we could do that. And, um, and I, my mom was a singer and yada, yada, yada. And so she took us to an agent and I sang, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. And I got the job in my first Broadway musical directed by Morton DaCosta called Maggie Flynn. And that's how I started. I fell in love with it and I kept going and never looked back. I love that it came from a, a childhood you wanting to help. Like it wasn't like, oh, I just want to be on stage. You're like, oh, I can do this thing. I can help the, the family and, and that. We were on food stamps and eating franks and beans and at one point living in a um, what I would call a flop house. It was, you know, we had one bed and I remember my mom was in the middle and, and we would both roll into her. Um, and, and it's not, you know, my Taylor story of woe, it's my story of wonder. In our lives, whatever circumstance we are given, we um, have the opportunity to turn it into something that is phenomenal and a phenomenal um, achievement or challenge to overcome. And it, it's how we look at things that change us. And the challenges lend to us, lend our attribute to our strength. And so yesterday I was at D23 in Los Angeles and we, you know, I, I think of um, the moments where I started and, and as a young actor, it was a dream, right? My dream has come true. And my dream has come true because I kept that dream alive. Where? In my heart, in my consciousness, in my brain. I told myself, I know that I can do this. Why? Because I loved it. If you link your passion to your dream, to your intelligence, to your heart, and add the, 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 the special sauce, which is sacrifice and dedication, you can do anything you want to do. Thank you for the question and thank you for sharing that story about your childhood. I, I did not know that and I appreciate you sharing it with us. A uh, question over here, please. Hi. Hi, I'm Austin from uh, Snohomish County, Washington. Oh, you made a drive, hi. <laughs> What's your subway order? <laughs> Turkey and cheese, baby. <laughs> no mayonnaise, salt, and pepper. Woo! <laughs> good answer. Yeah, good answer. That's the truth. I remember Subway. It's been a long time, and now you're getting me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Question over here. Hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Sam Sonicki, and uh, all of your villainous characters that I love to hate and fear, um, they all have a very almost Shakespearean quality to them with the iambic pentameter and the pacing that you do them. So I was curious what literary characters you might draw inspiration from when you are portraying a horrible, villainous person. <laughs> well, I have to say that it, my, my, my intention changed uh, when I, uh, after I watched a movie uh, that James Cagney, very old time actor did, um, called Public Enemy. And at the end of that movie, he's on a scaffold with a Tommy gun, and he's, he's shooting away, and all of a sudden, he's very serious, trying to kill people. You know he's gonna die any minute. And then all of a sudden, he breaks into this incredibly nefarious grin and laughter, and he says, top of the world, Ma! Top of the world! And then he, he gets shot, and he dies, and it's the end of the movie. And, um, and so, that was your, in my mind, 
um, he was releasing all of the demons he had accumulated within his existence during the film. And, and it reminded me of a film um, uh, called Good Will Hunting, where Robin Williams is having a scene with Matt Damon, and he, and, and, and he notices the kids, and the guy's holding a pack of cigarettes, and he says, you know, you have to decide what you want to be. You have to decide who you are. If you're a smoker, be a smoker. You know, if, if you're, you know, and, and then the yogis, I was reading the other day a book uh, about yoga, and some of you know I practice yoga, and, um, and it, it, oh, it was a quote by Neem Karoli Baba, uh, a, a great yogi who never wrote a book, but was a great meditator. And he said, a thief's dharma is to steal. A householder's dharma is to lock the door. So, you know, like in my life, I realize I've had, I've been gifted with the gift to be who I am. So the stereotype of the nefarious bad guy leads me to Moff Gideon. I'm getting to your answer. <laughs> I am um, in that I realize that the anti-hero, the villain, as you say, because I deny that word, <laughs> I do. Brian Cranston says you're just justifying. The villain, <laughs> he does. The anti-hero is the fallen hero. It's the hero who fell from grace. It's the hero who, who, who says, I'm not being heard. I'm frustrated, don't you see? I can do this right, I can lead all of you. Trust me, see me. And so therefore, it, 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 it strengthens what I believe that we as human beings are intrinsically good. It's that our, our, our desire, our ego, our mind gets the best of us and tells us, they're not listening to me, I'm gonna make them do it my way. Right? We have some of those in our world today in politics and other places who are so full of themselves that they don't see anyone else. So it's my job as an actor, when I came to the screen, I used my yoga practice to go, I want to make a villain who is about someone else, as well as about himself. He has to have all the traits I just outlined, but he also has to see the potential of other people for him to be human. And that's, that's what does it for me in the roles that I play that you label, or anyone labels as villainous or the bad guy, I want you to see some good because I want you to see a part of me and a part of you and a part of you and a part of you so you can understand and see what your challenge in life may be. What am I getting to here? The biggest challenge in my life is me. I'm in the way of my success. I'm in the way and create the days. Blame it on someone else. No, it starts right here. If I can get beyond myself, the world is my oyster. It's the way I think that everything will be available to me. My business will thrive. My family will thrive. I can be nice to people without feeling threatened. If I get rid of my own PTSD about the world I live in and stop blaming it on everyone else, but look at myself, then I'm ahead of the game. And today, I'm ahead of the game. <laughs> We're in the church of John Carlo right now. I swear to you, thank you. We have a question over here. What's your name? And I, it's gonna be hard to follow up on that. Uh, <laughs> my name is Mason. I'm from Portland, but Hi, I uh, lived in Albuquerque for a while. Uh, I, you recently did a scene in uh, Better Call Saul with uh, Reed Diamond. And uh, it was so well constructed, so well put together and acted that I actually felt empathy for Gustavo. And uh, I was uh, curious if you had some thoughts on being reunited with uh, Reed after all these years and what your takeaway was from that scene. Uh, thank you, great question. Um, I worked with Reed Diamond, for those of you who don't know, back in Homicide Life on the Street. 
um, Reed, who is now completely gray, was completely dark haired then. I, who am now salt and pepper, was completely dark haired then. And we, <laughs> we had some scenes together and it was really fun to work with him. In this particular scene, it was a revelation to me to be able to be vulnerable and explore a different part of Gus. Um, what you were seeing was a very complicated scene that had Gus finally be, being able to take a breath after, um, and, and for those of you who haven't seen this last season of Saul, I will be careful not to spoil it, um, but um, after um, being free of the yoke of, um, uh, of having to worry about his nemesis in these last few seasons. And he goes out and has dinner. Well, he goes to ostensibly have dinner, but also to make a connection with another human being. A lot of our lives are, are, are really about not only being seen, but being able to connect. And, and so uh, it's important. I come to Comic-Cons because I see the wonder and joy of people and human beings connecting. And I, I know in my life I spend so much time working and dedicating uh, and sacrificing some connection to the characters I play because I'm always in front of the camera. And, um, and it reminds me of another story which I can tell you maybe after, after that. We want to connect, we want to be, um, to be looked at and revered, but also loved. And Gus wants that too. So within that scene, um, Gustavo is looking for connection and he opens the door for that um, connection uh, with Reed Diamond's character, who's a sommelier. He talks about wine and Gus is like, <gasps> can live again, he can breathe again, and, and then he orders a particular, uh, and, and he's offered, um, I'll go get some very special wine, and, and, and Reed uh, Diamond, the actor, recedes into the restaurant to go find this very special wine to have Gus taste, and all of a sudden you see Gus go from that expectant wonder that he's gonna have a nice glass of wine, sit down, have dinner, maybe making a connection with this beautiful waiter, and he just, closes up like a clam, and he realizes, no, no, I am, I, that's not time. He gets up, it's heartbreaking, and he walks out. So, um, a lot of us in life um, sometimes really yearn for connection, and I tell my children to ask for what you want. And I came off the road many years ago in Austin, Texas, and I had been on the road for two months and I hadn't seen my youngest daughter who came to live with me when she was 10. She was probably around 14 at this time. And I walked the door late at night and I was shocked that she was up. And she looked me, she looked me up and down and looked in my eyes and she said, Papa, Papa, are you all right? She said, what's going on? And I said, I just need to be held. And she opened her arms really wide and she held me for what seemed like forever, but it was probably around four solid minutes with her whole heart. And I cried like I'm crying now. And she broke away and looked me in the eyes. And she shook her head and she said, it's okay. So, you know, sometimes we just need to make that connection, whether it be a hand touch or to be held, and to feel someone else's throbbing heart against ours to know that we're loved, that we're cared for, and that we're cherished. Neville was a total badass. How much physical training did you have to do for that role, and were you shocked when it jumped the rails at the end of season two and didn't get a season three? Oh, that show, so many people are discovering that show now, and I'm so happy for you as fans to have that discovery. I think of Tom Neville often. I wasn't finished with that character. I had so much more to give. Um, I thought Tom Neville was a bad... I mean, he just was. I think of him now, uh, because I'm doing a show called Parish for AMC in New Orleans. Um, I go back there after the Emmys on Monday night to go and um, begin our sixth week of shooting. And I'm playing a character who I feel has some of Tom's, some, some of Tom in him. He's not, uh, he's an everyman, so he's not as, as up the ladder as Tom. Tom was a shapeshifter. That's a great show, you should see it. Um, training, you asked me a question. Uh, I ran every day in, in, when we did the pilot in Atlanta, Georgia at 100 degrees uh, in the humidity. And so I'm a runner, 
uh, I'm a yogi, and at that time I was um, a little bit younger and um, a little more headstrong and bullish. Um, now I realize I have to take care of myself in a little different way, so maybe I would run at, uh, at 90 degrees at 11 p.m. at night as opposed to 12 o'clock in the afternoon. But I ran, um, I rode a horse, I went and did a lot of riding training. Um, I have a military background, so that you could get a sense that I, 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 I put my head in a space where, um, I have news for you. It, you know, unless you, you can't lead, just think of this concept, unless you can follow, right? It took me a long time to get with this, right? So I was in military school, almost went into the army, wanted to lead people, but I realized um, years later that I could never lead people unless I could follow. Unless, and so what I loved yesterday at D23, talking about Mandalorian, they asked a question of all the Mandos that were in the interview, and they didn't ask it of me. And I said, um, so I wanna just take a step back and tell you, they asked a question, why do you, why do you love the Mandalorians? What, what are they, who are they? And I relate to the Mandalorians because I'm a soldier inside. And I'm a soldier for humanity. I'm a soldier for people standing up. I'm a soldier for compassion, for love. And I, I have a training as a soldier, you march, you, I carried a rifle, I learned how to shoot, but I learned how to take orders. Just the word itself now, I hate authority, makes me cringe, but it, it's an order. It suggested that you follow. What do I love about Mandalorians? They're all the same. They're faceless, they have helmets, they become part of our group. They are a group that is strong in numbers, right? So until you're able to follow, you'll never be able to lead because you have to be part of a unit. And it reminded me in D23 yesterday, thinking about all of us as human beings and what we do, we do what we're told now because we have an iPhone that tells us what to do, a computer that tells us what to do. And we, some of us have, are, have less access to our hearts, to the universal voice inside of us that allow us to be connected to our intuition. See, George C. Scott told me many years ago, great actor, that everything you need to know is inside of you. Yes, you learn from other people. Yes, we go to school. Yes, we get proper education. But you know in your gut what is right, what is wrong, what your path is, what you should do, if you can listen to the voice. So I urge you to listen to the voice and do what is your calling. Because when you find your calling, you find your passion, you find your love, and your life will change forever. We have a question over here. What's your name? Hi, my name is Dave. Hi, Dave. From Spokane. Uh, my wife and I agree that you have a very amazing voice especially when you're in character. So our question is, if you could read, narrate any audio book, what would it be? Oh my goodness, I've done a few. Um, I, and I love using my voice. I've learned how to take it away as an actor because I came up on the Broadway stage and you have to get reach the back row and we never had quite this technology of microphone. Uh, so when I act, for some characters, I take away my voice completely because I don't want to use it or have it be overused. Um, uh, I, I did a book called Way Past Cool um, that I narrate for Harper and Row. I've done three or four books. Uh, I've done um, Hardball also for Harper and Row. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I've done quite a few things, but you asked me what would I like to do. You know, um, I love the poetry and, and the seamless kind of writing of Rudyard Kipling. Um, I love being a part of Mobley with John Favreau, um, and I can't, uh, I, I'm thinking, I, I love prose, so, but I'm not coming up with the one, the quintessential one that really moves me, so I don't wanna just, you know, we, I don't wanna BS and just say anything. You know, so in life, we're asked questions, and your question is really great, and we're afraid that we don't have the answer, because we live in a world of iPhone, and, and we need to have the answer, because that makes us cool, or smart, or whatever else. And so I realize, that, um, that I'm one of those. 
And so I'm allowing myself to be able to go, I don't know. There's something really freeing about it. I don't know, ask me later. Like, so it's a practice, as opposed to always having the answer, because we're supposed to be smart. You know, um, I don't care anymore about being smart. I care about being heartfelt and being true and organic. Um, I do some audio books, I, I love that, and um, uh, I don't know what that is. Thank you for your question. That's a great, that's a great one. And a real answer. Hi, how are you? Question over here. Uh, uh, my name's Ryan from Bend. Hi, Ryan. You're Ryan. one of my favorite actors because you're able to um, get the villain persona really well. And I don't, and do you know what makes your characters really eerie or scary? I think it's my stillness. Uh, again, I, I relay back to stillness. You hear that? Yeah, it's really right. <laughs> no, it's nothing. Like, when do we go to nothing? If I stop my chatter and the chatter of my mind, I hear the machinery behind the stage. You probably can't hear that because you're back over there. But you kind of hear the hum of the universe. And I think what makes my villains um, a little more progressive and a little frightening is that I leave space, space for nothing. So when you're in a conversation and someone's just looking at you, they're not smiling. They're not, they're not, that's nothing, they're not smiling. I'm not gritting on her. I could grit on you now. I mean, I could grit on you and give you a dirty look. Right, I'm not giving you the melodia. The I'm, still look is the worst. <laughs> like, uh, just like, your parents did it to you, maybe. I don't know how old you are when you did something wrong and just look at you. Well, that's what makes my cat cat characters terrorizing. Also, I take my brain away. So I don't allow you to know what I'm thinking. Right? I don't want to let you know what I'm thinking. And that can be frightening. So I think that's probably really effective for me. I put you on the spot. Also, when you look someone directly in the eyes, it's a, it's a little awkward and you hold that, and if they can't look back, there's something wrong with them. You can't, I love you. <laughs> I'm like, don't stare. Just yeah. your eyeballs open to not break eye contact. I think that's what it is. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great question. Question over here, hi, what's your name? A lot of people that seem to know you because they watch your shows, but has there ever been a time where you met someone who has no idea who you are? Did you ever have a genuine conversation that left an impact? Wow, well, great question. Yeah, almost once a week or maybe once a month. It gets less and less the more I get circulated through the cycle of, um, you know, commercialism. Uh, but, it, <laughs> but it does happen and I love it. Uh, and it happens sometimes with two people and one comes up and goes, <gasps> and, and, I, and the other person next to them, oh gosh, <laughs> let me cry. You know, I, I think I can be very clear that I want my legacy to be about um, about empowering people. Uh, for me, the, the thing that moves me the most inside is to bring people to their best selves. Uh, I feel like if that were the thing that I could leave behind is to say that you, each and every one of you, are somebody. You're more than just somebody. You have a contribution to each other and a contribution to me and a contribution uh, to the world. And so for you to fulfill your destiny, your dream, your earthly obligation, it lifts the energy of our world up. It lifts my energy up. So dream your highest dream. Think your highest and deepest possible thought, not only for yourselves, but for your brother and your sister and your mother and your father and your children first. It's sort of like, put your, they say put your own mask on first and then help someone else. I say be in service. Think of others before you in every desire, everything you ever wanted about your life, providing that you're willing to dedicate, sacrifice, um, something, and spend time developing the knowledge of who you really are. Then you're gonna find that you're not who you think you are. You are 
much more than that and that your contribution is great and that you will become part of making this world better. Thanks so much for having me. Let's bring this church to its feet. Pastor John Carlo, let's close the church.